We're going to look at, look at Luke chapter 9. Nine, eighteen through twenty seven. And uh, to our guests, I, I imagine you're you're used to saying amen or hallelujah and stuff like that during during a service. We're, we we don't normally do that here, but if you want to, by all means, you you can you can do that. That's not gonna that's not gonna offend anybody or bother me or anything like that. So go go right ahead if if you feel led to. So, but uh, let's. Let's look at uh, Luke 19, 18 through 27. Peter's confession of Christ. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses this life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 19 there. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Both then and now, people have many different ideas about, about who Jesus is. There's a lot of different ideas about who is Jesus, what is he about, what was his purpose here? Was, was he really the Son of God or, or, or not? And they, they, I mean, they mention all of these people who had been deceased at this time. So John the Baptist was already dead, and, and Elijah was long gone, and, and uh, one of the old prophets come back to life. Uh, these, these are all people that they thought Jesus really was. And, and to this day, there's, there's Muslims and, and Jews that both affirm that Jesus was a good prophet. A lot, of, a lot of those people, or even if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, you affirm that Jesus is a, is a great teacher, sure. There's, there's a lot of ideas about who Jesus really actually was. And, and the reality is that most people believe in God. Lots of people believe in God. The last poll that I saw said 86% of people in the United States believed in God. 86%. That's, that's really high. Most people believe in God, but what you believe about Jesus is everything. That's what it really boils down to. Who is Jesus? What's he about? If you believe in God, great. But what do you believe about Jesus? That's what it really comes down to. Because once you talk, we talk about God, oh yeah, I mean, God unites everybody. But, but if you talk about Jesus, okay, now, now it's getting complicated. Now we're getting controversial. Now we don't want people talking about that so much. Because if Jesus is a good prophet or a teacher, then you're going to look past him. You're going to look for something else. If Jesus is the one and only Son of God, however, then you're going to look no further. And that's who he is. He's the one and only Son of God. And then Peter here, he makes this bold confession of who Jesus is. You are the Christ of God. Christ of God. And it says, the Christ. The Christ means the one who was promised throughout the whole Old Testament. The one who is coming. And so Peter says, Jesus, you are the one that the whole Old Testament was pointing to. All of the prophets and the law, those were all pointing ahead to you, anticipating you. 
You are, you are the actual one that everybody's looking for. And then it kind of takes a surprising turn here. In verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Jesus, you are the Christ of God. Okay, don't tell anybody. Seems kind of strange, doesn't it? I mean, didn't Jesus go say, tell, tell the whole world? Go into all nations. I mean, wouldn't you want to spread that good news? Hey, we actually have the Christ here. The, the one that we've been waiting for for centuries, we finally have him now. Oh, no, don't tell anybody. That, that, that's a little strange. Well, here's, here's the thing. We, we, and even today, this is true, not just them. We look for a conquering hero Messiah, not a suffering servant Messiah. That's who Jesus was. He was a suffering servant, not a conquering hero. People wanted an Alexander the Great who was going to get rid of Rome and push them back all the way across the Mediterranean in this glorious victory and reunite the Jewish people. All of this, all of this political, military sort of thing. People were looking for like a new King David. But here's, here's the thing. Jesus wasn't shy about who he was. The, the real problem was with us. Is what, what kind of a Messiah do we look for? So verse 22, and he said, at verse 22, the word and there, at least the way it is in, in the NIV there, might be better translated after. These two sentences in verses 21 and 22 are really connected. In the original Greek there, it's supposed to be after. This is the reason why Jesus is, not, is telling him not to tell anybody. Don't tell anybody yet because... I have to suffer. The Christ of God is supposed to suffer. So I want you to keep quiet about it for now. They were not to tell anyone because the way of Christ is a way of suffering. It's not glorious victory. It's a way of suffering, a sacrifice and service. And in verse 22, it says he must suffer. Jesus must suffer. There's a special Greek word in there where it says it is necessary that the Christ must suffer. Not might, not could, definite, for sure. And while we usually see suffering as failure for Jesus, it, it's necessary. He had to. This is the way it's got to be. The suffering is not failure. It's not an accident. Suffering is part of what it means to be Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. On Hebrews 12 that you're going to read Wednesday in your sermon Bible reading tracks, where it says... When you are suffering or going through trials and difficulties many times, God is treating you as sons. What son isn't disciplined by his father? If you're going through difficult times, God's disciplining you. This is the way of Christ. Look at the screen here with me if you would. Answer the question with me. Is it significant that he was crucified instead of dying some other way? Yes, this death convinces me that he shouldered the curse which lay on me, since death by crucifixion was accursed by God. Jesus died on a cross. He wasn't hanged. He wasn't beheaded. He was hung on a tree because that meant that he is suffering the curse of God, which should have fallen on us. <coughs> And this whole, this whole section here, this, this pericope, this is talking about who he is. 
the context here is talking about who Jesus is. Who is he? Who is he? He's, he's the Christ. He's the Christ. Last week, Jesus was, we talked about how he was condemned after telling the truth about who he was. He was in front of the Sanhedrin, and they said, are you the Christ of God? He said, I am. You deserve to die. He was condemned and convicted for who he was, his identity, who he was. Jesus' very identity dictates that he be a suffering servant. Suffering is what it means to be Jesus, the Christ. Especially foretold in Isaiah 53, the whole section on the suffering servant. We look for glorious leaders, and Jesus came and said, no, it's, this way is the way of, of suffering, of sacrifice, of service. And then something that's even more unsettling. Verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So it's not just Jesus suffered for us and then we get to party and have a good time. No, we have to follow him. We have to be suffering servants too. And our salvation is by grace, and it's free to us, but our service to Christ is costly. Salvation is by grace, it's free to us, but when we want to follow Jesus, that way of Christ, that's difficult. That's not easy. If you want to come after me, Jesus said, then you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and follow me. You have to do what I did. And that's hard. Following Christ means obedience unto death, even. Can we obey Jesus, our Lord? Can we obey unto the death of our plans, our comforts, our pride, our very life? This is, this is difficult. This isn't easy. This is hard. We have a bunch of people here today who, who know what it means to, to surrender and to have to give up a lot of things because of Christ. It's tough to say no to, to addictions, to, to pride, to self-reliance. But that's what Christ calls us to do. To die to our very selves. Our, our Lord and Master was obedient unto death, even death on a cross, as it says in Philippians 2. Even death on a cross. And we must be obedient no less. So don't settle for easy obedience. It's easy to do things that everybody else does. That's easy. Let's do what's hard. Let's do the hard obedience. It was hard for Jesus to go to the cross. It was hard for him, no doubt, to not hit that abort button that he could have hit at any time, calling down 12 legions of angels to save him. So stand up to, for example, temptations in prayer. Don't just go along with them, even if everybody else is. Stand up to them. Say no to addictions. Even the harmless ones that we think we have. Start saying no to those things. Paul says, everything's permissible for me, but I'm not going to be mastered by anything. I only have one master, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. One or a couple of the testimonies said, all all we have to do is, is surrender. That's very true. We need to surrender our lives, our very selves, to Jesus Christ. And our Savior showed us that salvation means surrender. This is the way of Christ. If you call Him your Lord, then this is what He's commanded. 
If you call Him your Savior, this is the way to be saved. If we want Christ's resurrection, we must face Christ's cross. This is the way, he says. So mention Jesus Christ without being ashamed. Talk about your faith to somebody who might not know who he is or what he can do. Or do something really bold, forgive 70 times 7. That's hard. Especially when people have severely wronged us. The bottom line here, people, dear friends, we can't follow Christ casually. We follow at all costs. At all costs. Verse 23, one more time. He said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It means giving up your entire life. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. Let's surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. Whatever the cost. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, you've sent your son Jesus Christ to die for us so that we might be saved. And Lord, we have a chance to follow him, and that's not an easy task. We pray that you would send us your spirit so that, Lord, we would have the strength to walk in his footsteps, to take up our cross daily even, and follow him. And we pray, O Lord, that we would know not only the suffering and the death of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ and the victory over sin and death that he offers. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.